Indiana Jones' worst fear is not uh, women or commitment, and it's not um, Nazis, it's snakes. And as he's searching for the Ark of the Covenant, they unearth the Well of Souls. They pull back and they see the ground slithering and snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? And his friend Sala offers little encouragement. Asks, you go, uh, very dangerous, you go first. And so they descend Indiana Jones down into the pit. And on his way down, he drops. And he comes face to face with the deadly King Cobra. Now, the interesting thing about this is this film was made in 1981. That was long before CGI had had its way. So what you see crawling down there are 6,000 real snakes. And the, the uh, filmmakers had to keep antivenom on hand for when the snakes would bite people. And what you don't see is when uh, Indiana Jones is face to face with that King Cobra, is that there's someone off screen taunting that snake so it'll show its full crown. And the only thing separating Harrison Ford from this deadly snake is a tiny piece of glass. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? That's the question that the Israelites are going to ask today as we look at the story of the wanderers in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. It says that the Israelites traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake and they lived. So God, we pray that you would use this crazy story as an example of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Who here likes snakes? Okay. We have a few Slytherins in the house. Excellent. Most people, I would say, are kind of creeped out a little bit by snakes a little bit. I know someone who's deathly afraid of snakes. His name is Calvin Reynolds. <laughs> One day, a snake slithered into the church and went into his office behind his bookshelf. And I don't think Calvin went in his office for at least a week after that. It was pretty crazy. The thing about snakes is that for a common person, we can't tell which one is deadly and which one's not. One of the things my kids love to do when they go to the zoo is in the reptile house to discover which snakes are venomous and which ones aren't. And as a parent, I'm extremely grateful for that thin piece of glass that separates my kid from this deadly creature. And so today, as we look at this story of the snakes, in true Sesame Street fashion, the lesson will be brought to you by the letter R. <laughs> Our first R is for rebellion. The people rebelled against God with their constant complaining. It says they grew impatient along the way. They had been wandering through the desert for almost 40 years, turning left and right, backwards and forwards, and never making it to the promised land. And that impatience turned to grumbling. And they grumbled about how their life would have been so much better back in Egypt. And the thing is that most of these people were the next generation. They weren't the people who had left Egypt. They were the children of them. So they weren't familiar with the life in Egypt. They forgot that their families were slaves. They forgot that they were forced to make bricks without hay. And they forgot that the Egyptians would come and take the babies and throw them into the Nile River. 
And they also complained about their lack of supplies, how they had no food and no water. And they complained even about God's provision for them. They talk about this miserable food, which is the manna from heaven that God provided for them each morning. And I'll admit that if I had to eat the same bread for 40 years, I'd probably be complaining about it too. But the result of their complaining led to a snake infestation. It said, the, the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit many people, and many Israelites died. And some people think this is a great example of how the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament, how the God of the Old Testament was a vengeful God, and the God of the New Testament was a God of love. But both the Old and the New Testament say that God is gracious and compassionate. And then it says that he's slow to anger. So these people must have done something that really crossed the line for God, which resulted in the snake infestation. You see, we talk about how the, the sins of the parents are passed down to the next generation. And this first generation that came out of Egypt were always grumbling to Moses and saying, complaining to Moses about all that Moses did wrong. This next generation grumbled against Moses and God. They complained that God was the one that, for their problems. And there was a result for that rebellion. The result of their grumbling leads to a snake infestation. The result of the snake infestation leads to people being bit. And the result of people being bit leads to death. And so the people then realize the error of their ways and they cry out to God. It says, they came to Moses and said, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take these snakes away from us. They had realized that it was their actions that caused the problem. It was their grumbling and complaining that led to this. They also realized that there was nothing that they could do. There was nothing they could do to stop the snakes. They couldn't call an exterminator to shoo away the snakes. There was no urgent care facility they could go to to get, take care of the snake bites. And they realized that only God could rescue them. And God provided a very unique rescue plan. It says, the Lord told Moses, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone bitten can look at it and live. Now God could have simply eradicated all the snakes, just been gone with them. Or he could have just healed everybody there instantly. But he chose a different plan, a strange plan. A plan that required the people to return to God. So that Moses made the bronze snake and put it on a pole and anyone who was bitten it uh, would look at the bronze snake. They, the Israelites had to turn away from their grumbling and complaining and return their eyes to God. They got so focused on their own problems and they distracted themselves from what was truly right. And they also needed to take a step of faith, that it had to be a personal choice, that each person had to return to God. They had to uh, return their eyes up to this snake. Now, a person could have ignored God's plan and thought, oh, this is the stupidest plan ever. I'm not going to follow this. And that would have led to their death. Or they could have placed their faith in God, looked at the bronze snake, and been healed. And all who looked to that snake were restored. It says that they looked to the bronze snake and they lived. That God brought healing to everyone who looked. Where there should have been death, there was now new life. And this is a strange, strange story. But it's also a familiar story. It's a story that's repeated throughout the Old Testament. The people of Israel continually rebelled against God. They would worship idols and take their eyes off of God. And the result was often enemy conquest, when people would come and take over their, their kingdom. And the people would then eventually realize the error of their way, and they would return to God and cry out for a rescue. And when they were rescued... Uh, they would return to worshiping God and the nation of Israel would be restored. And things would go well for a short time and the cycle would start over again and again 
and again. Happened throughout Israel's history. And Jesus, he was very familiar with the cyclical nature of Israel. And one night, he's meeting with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a person who knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards, left and right. He knew all the stories. And so Jesus thinks back to the story of the snake. And he uses it as an example for his own life. He says to Nicodemus, just as Moses was lifted, uh, just as Moses lifted the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite name for himself, uh, must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Here Jesus is comparing himself with the snake on a pole. And just as the snake was lifted up so that people would have healing. Jesus was going to be lifted up on the cross so that all who look to him would have eternal life. As I was doing my research for this, I came across this quote about this Jesus being lifted up, and Warren Wiersbe says this. He says that the verb lifted up has a dual meaning, to be crucified and to be glorified. In his gospel, John points out that our Lord's crucifixion was actually a means of his glorification. The cross was not the end of his glory, it was the means of his glory. And so it makes me wonder, was Jesus just thinking back and thought, this story of the snake, this would make a great anecdote or great analogy for what I'm going to go through? Or is there something more? Did God have John 3, 14 and 15 written when the events of Numbers 21, 4 through 9 occurred? Did God intricately craft the story of the snake infestation so that we would have a better understanding of Jesus on the cross? And did God, from the beginning, have a plan for the redemption of humanity that's been echoed throughout our stories and finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ? Like I said, it's a strange, strange story, but a familiar story. It's a story that's repeated throughout the Old Testament, but finds new life in the New Testament. It's the story of the good news, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, who says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we are subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so no one can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We need to understand that we as humans, we live in rebellion against God. We follow our sinful nature, the things that pull us away from God, the desires and passions of our flesh, the things that we want over what God has for us. We all live rebelling against God. And it says that we are following our own desires and we're obeying the devil. And this is the devil, the serpent that we see in the Garden of Eden, that lured Adam and Eve away from God and is also luring us away from following God. And the result of our rebellion is death, that we are dead because of our disobedience and many sins, that there are consequences for our sins, and our rejection of following God's ways leads us subject to God's anger. The rebellion against God results in death. 
And we need to realize that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. That salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. We need to realize it was our rebellion that caused the problem. It was our actions that have consequences. Realize that there's nothing we can do to make ourselves right before God. And we need to realize that only God can rescue us. And that's why God is so rich in mercy and He loves us so much that God provided this unique rescue plan, a strange plan where He sent Jesus who lived a perfect life but was sentenced to die. And Jesus was lifted up on the cross so that all who look to Him will be healed. And our job is to return to God, to turn our eyes back to Jesus. This is by grace you have been saved through faith. Each of us need to realize that it's our own choice to look to Jesus. We have to humble ourselves and place our faith in God and the trust in the plan of Jesus. We need to return our gaze from ourselves back to God. In the Greek, there's a word metanoia, which is our English word for repentance, which means to a change of mind or a 180 degree change in direction. It talks about how we are moving away from God, following the leading of the serpent. And we need to stop. We need to realize the error of our ways and we need to return to God and repent. And when we return to God, we are restored. And it says, this here is my favorite verse. It says that we are God's masterpiece, God's most cherished and prized piece of art on display for all to see. And that he has created us anew, that he's, Jesus restored our relationship with God so that we won't be apart from him. And he, we've been given a restored purpose to do the good things he has planned for us long ago, that God has an amazing plan and purpose for us that he wants us to live it out. As I said, it's a strange but familiar story, repeated throughout the Old Testament, repeated throughout the New Testament, and repeated in our lives. As Sheriff Woody says, there's a snake in our boots. We've all rebelled against God, and the snakes of our sins have infested our lives. And the result is that we've been bitten, which leads to death. And we need to realize the error of our ways and return our eyes to God. And He will rescue us. He rescued us by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die, to be lifted up on the cross and die. And all who return their eyes to Jesus will find life, and God will give us a restored plan and purpose for our lives. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? In John 3, 14 and 15, we see that just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So this snake on a pole reminds us of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, and that everyone who looks on it, looks to Jesus and believes, will have eternal life. So the snake on the pole reminds us of God's amazing grace. And the beautiful thing about John 3, 14 and 15 is that it leads into John 3, 16, the most popular verse in the Bible, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The snakes of our sins lead to death, but God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son who was lifted up on the cross so that whoever returns their gaze to him and places their faith in Jesus will not perish, but will have a restored life. Amen.